I I've been done plenty of these already, but still I'm making little mistakes. So thank you everyone uh, for joining. Um, and I'm really pleased uh, to be here as part of the series and even more honored to be finishing it off. I didn't realize I was the last one. So as Hannah was saying, no pressure, but hopefully finish on a high. Um, so as Hannah said, uh, my name is Jessie. I am a performance, sport and performance psychologist working at the Sport Ireland Institute. Um, I did attend Catherine's uh, webinar a few weeks ago, um, which was all about fear and overcoming fear in the water. Um, and I suppose the follow on that I can kind of add to what Catherine spoke about um, is I suppose some real practical application and some practical strategies that hopefully you guys can take away whatever level you're at. There may be some reference to sport and competitive sport, but hopefully you can get something. Everyone at every level can get something from this. I want this to be something that you can go away. And if you're getting in the water tomorrow, you have some practical applications. So understanding you now have an understanding of emotions like fear and where that can come from well what are some of the strategies I can use to overcome it and some of them will be probably expanding on or just referring back to what Catherine already said because she covered so much in such in her brilliant webinar so just to introduce who I am um I have a kind of varied background when it comes to sport I've been very fortunate to be uh, part of the Olympic team um, in two different forms over the years. I competed at the Olymp London Olympics, I think where Hannah was as well, um, all the way back in 2012 um, on the 4 by 400 meter relay in athletics. I was a 400 meter hurdler um, in a former life as well. That's me going over a hurdle towards the end of the race, hence the pained looking expression. Um, but in my current my current endeavors in sport, I am currently undertaking a PhD in sports psychology um, in UL with a focus on athlete mental health. And in my current role in the Sport Ireland Institute, I'm supporting um, athletes on their journey to the Olympics and their elite pursuits. Uh, I was very fortunate to be part of the team in Tokyo last year, part of the support staff, and I've also been to European Youth Olympics and um, European Games. So I have a very varied and kind of broad knowledge of the theory and I suppose the application of these kind of psychological strategies. So yeah, just to kind of give you a bit of a background of where I'm coming from, sometimes it comes from the books and sometimes it comes from real life lived experience. So what I kind of hope that you can take, so this is a kind of a very condensed version of what some of the outcomes are, but what I want you to, to try and take away from today is learning to control the controllables. And we'll talk about different things that we can control. Some emotion regulation strategies and fear obviously being one predominant emotion that's been spoken about already. So looking at some strategies around fear, nerves, anxiety, they'd be big kind of the big hitters when it comes to my work. Um, strategies to manage our focus some strategies to build our confidence and then we're going to try a little bit of imagery or you may know it better as visualization at the end so um as hannah said obviously there won't be a live chat but please throw any q and questions you might have into the q a and i'd love to answer as many of them as i can at the end if my screen would move on there we go so obviously this is not the most um in practical format for kind of engagement and back and forth but what I kind of figured you know based on my experience across lots of different sports I currently work across a number of sports and most of them they're pretty much all individual cycling um uh, track cycling athletics gymnastics diving swimming sailing uh badminton and I'm definitely missing one and it's probably glaring st sticking out of my brain brain, brain glaring at me and a lot of the sports I work in would have a lot of have a lot of kind of fear elements to it. And I know obviously today is not about fear, but I am referring back to Catherine's brilliant webinar that some of the challenges probably correlate quite closely to what you face when you're out in the water. I work with platform divers. You can imagine standing up and they actually brought me up onto the 10 meter platform and the fear and the, the emotions that kick in when you're standing looking over a 10 meter board or pretty intense or if you're out in the out in the water on a laser radial boat in you know very difficult conditions or if you're on a track bike that can go up to 60 kilometers an hour very and um, with no brakes so 
lots of stresses, lots of challenges. And I suppose they're obviously from, you know, these are elite athletes, but they these are the kind of experiences if you're competing at any level in those sports. So what are the kind of general psychological challenges you might face? So I'm kind of making some assumptions here, and that's what I'm going to kind of base some of my strategies around. So these are probably common across all sports, you know, the uncertainty is the unknown, especially in something like um, canoeing, kayaking, where you might be taking on new bodies of water, not really knowing what to expect, not knowing what's around this corner. Um, from that can come lots of negative negative emotions, things like fear, nerves, anxiety, stress. Um, some other challenges might be battling with the negative thoughts that are going on in your head. We'll look at some strategies for that. Um, low confidence. Obviously, there needs to be, I suppose, a, a certain level of confidence to get into a boat and actually go out on the water, especially if you're in a solo boat, or the confidence to be with um, you know, fellow paddlers, maybe low motivation. Um distraction or improper focus and what you may notice there is I didn't say lack of focus or no focus or inattention I I purposely said improper focus because what we'll talk about is the idea that we're never not paying attention or we're never not focused we're just our focus or attention is maybe not where we want it to be so even if we're daydreaming our focus has gone internally or maybe we're getting distracted by something external we, we don't even realize that's what's taking our attention and finally, the effects of emotions on the body. And we'll look a little bit on that. And again, that was something that was talked about before in terms of tension and how we can kind of overcome that. So the first thing, and it's probably this, one of the sports psychologist mantras is control the controllables. What can I control and how am I going to control it? And, you know, we it's very easy to say this to an athlete, you know, focus on what you can control control the controllables, all those kind of, you know, buzz, you know, those kind of buzz phrases. But what does that mean? What are the things I can control and how do I actually control them? So introducing something like the circle of control. OK, when I'm in the boat, there's an awful lot of things that are out of my control. And when it comes to things like fear and negative emotions that may rise, you know, how often do they come from? things that we can control which is that green circle the stuff that's closest to us and um, is it does it sit in a circle of influence so something that we have some control over but mainly just we can influence or does it come from things that are out of our control and what are the things that might fit into those circles so you know for example what are the things that we don't have full control over because sometimes even just drawing our attention to that it might seem counterintuitive to kind of say okay let's talk about all the things you can't control sometimes it's important to draw our attention and create some self-awareness of what are the things I can control you know things like now I'm not even going to pretend that I'm an expert but rapids and eddies or something I'm learning are important aspects in your sport the water conditions so you know where different aspects of the water conditions things like capsizing may not be in your control the general environment that you're paddling in the weather and then outcome would be something that'd be really important if you're competitive um you're, you're in a competitive uh, aspect of the sport that you're going into races unfortunately the outcome is not fully in your control you know if your outcome that you're focused on is winning everyone in the race probably wants to win and you only have a certain amount of control over that so an awful lot of things that are not in our control and if you think about the things that bring on fear or negative thoughts or negative emotions it's probably more often than not related to things in that red circle, related to the things that we can't control. And sometimes we just leave it there. We kind of accept it. You know, we recognize the things we can't control and we let them consume us. We worry about the weather is we worried about attacking rapids or, you know, about what if I capsize or what if the conditions are like this or what if the conditions change? And in that moment, it's learning to recognize the things that we can influence and, and control can be really, really important. So what are the things we can influence? And what do I mean by influence? The circle of influence are the kind of things that we don't have full control over, but as it says, we can influence. So emotions, whether it's my own emotions or the general emotions, maybe you're in a training group or a squad, or you're going out with, you know, some, just some kind of paddling partners, if that's what you call them, training partners, emotions are contagious. So if you're feeling a certain emotion, maybe like panic or fear, that can spread to your to people around you in the same way that if you are quite calm and quite relaxed, 
that can kind of spread as well. So emotions are contagious. So we can not only influence the emotions of others, but others' emotions can influence us. Same way as energy. Energy is contagious. You know, if you have someone who's really energized and can't wait to go out and tackle some really difficult parts of the course, that can be contagious as well. You know, you're energized by their enthusiasm, the general atmosphere being the same. And then things like teammates and coaches, you have some influence because, you know, you may feel quite nervous about a certain aspect of your training and you can influence what the training might look like based on having conversations with them. And they can also also influence you by boosting confidence and um, energy and emotions. So recognizing the things that we can influence. And you're probably thinking, okay, my emotions, should that not go in the green circle? Because that's me. And unfortunately, no, even though what's going to be in the green circle is all stuff related to me, directly to me that I can control. Unfortunately, our emotions don't really fit into that because our emotions are not something fully in our control. They're something we, they just naturally happen. You know, if I, if I tell a funny joke, which I'm not, I'm not a comedian, but if I was to say something funny, you wouldn't choose to, you wouldn't think that's funny. I'm going to laugh now. You don't kind of choose that response, choose that reaction. A reaction will happen the same way as something scary happens in the water. Your initial emotional reaction is a fear or panic or heart racing, whatever that response is or reaction is. So the emotion we feel is just a physiological response or reaction to the circumstance. What we can control and why it's in the influence and not in the red circle is because we can then influence how we respond. So we can't control the initial reaction to the emotion. It just happens. The emotional reaction happens. We can then choose to control how we respond. And we'll look at a few strategies around that. How do we respond more appropriately or in a you know a more helpful manner to the emotion I've just feel, felt? And when it comes to things like fear, anxiety, nerves, panic, that can be a really important skill to, ho- to hone in on because they're the kind of fit, um, emotions you don't really want to be letting take hold and that reaction take hold when you're out on the boat. So then bring the circle of control, focusing on the circle of control right in the center, the green, what's fully in my control. And sometimes it's the boring stuff that we like to overlook. It's my warm up. It's my general preparation off the water. It's my boat preparation. Is my boat in the best condition it can be? Is my equipment up to scratch? Have I got all the right safety gear on? Nutrition, you know, am I actually, you know, energized and have enough energy to actually take on the training session I'm going to do? Or am I going to be out for on the water for a long time? Will I have the energy to get me back home? Um, obviously knowledge of the route is really important. You know where the kind of the, you know, the pinch points are, the kind of the more challenging parts of the route and knowing that in advance and being able to make a plan for that. The mindset we go out with, the mindset being, okay, this is going to be a really tough training session or this is going to be a really hard race, but I'm really excited to go and give it a go or this is a really tough race, I may as well just not bother. You know, what? where is your mindset? That's actually in your control. Again, where you place your attention and your focus is in your control. And we're going to look at some strategies to kind of manage that attention and focus a little bit later. And then our responses. So how we respond to mistakes, how we respond to other people, how we respond to our emotional reaction. So when it comes to to starting off with, it's first of all recognizing, okay, what are the things I can control? What are the things I can influence? And what are the things that I can control, that I need to learn to adapt or accept? And what are the things then that are causing the most concern or worry or challenge for me when I'm on the boat? And once you've identified those, ask yourself this question, okay, I'm I'm feeling a strong emotional response or I'm feeling a certain way. Is the thing that I'm worrying about or concerned about or fearful of, is it in my control? Okay, if you can say yes, how can I maximize it? So if it's fully in my control, if it's in that green circle, if it's boat prep, if it's training, if if it's knowledge of the route, have I maximized it? Do I know, know the route inside out? Do I know how to attempt certain parts of the route that I know are challenging? Maybe there's someone else who knows it better. Could I ask my coach? Could I be using better equipment or could I be, you know, looking for better ways of using things? If the thing that I'm concerned about is not in my control, okay, what can I switch my focus to? So I've identified that the thing I'm concerned or fearful of is in the red circle. Can't do anything about it. I can't change the weather conditions. I can't change the water conditions. 
what can I focus on instead? Okay, I'm going to focus on what my teammates are doing, or I'm going to focus on having a race plan or strategy. So having something really specific to focus on that's fully in my control. And then, okay, it's not fully in my control. I have some control over it. What's my plan for it? Okay, it, it's something that's maybe in that yellow, that influence sit, um, box. Is that, you know, is it that I know I have some teammates or some training partners who get very nervous in certain situations? Is my plan just to stay away from them? Or I know I tend to get very nervous on X occasion. What's my plan for when I'm nervous? Oh, I thought I'm going to use that strategy that Jesse taught me, which we're going to look at. So asking that question and having plans, because too often we allow ourselves to feel the fear and recognize where the fear is coming from or not even doing the work to recognize where fear is coming from and whether we can actually control it. Because sometimes things are more in our control than we realize. And if they're not, there's still things we can do about it. So to follow on from that idea of taking control of things, taking control of your emotions. Now, I said that emotions are not in our control, so this might seem a bit contradictory to what I've already said. But how do we, how could we take control of our emotions? What ways could we try and kind of take back control of our emotions? Well, first of all, acknowledging. What is it? Naming the emotion that I'm feeling. Finding ways to change the emotion. We'll talk about how we can do that using strategies like self-talk. Or reframe the emotion. So actually switch your perspective on how you're you're looking at the emotion. So in terms of naming it, this comes from cognitive behavioral therapy, the idea of understanding the link between our thoughts, our emotions and our behavior. So how we act, how we feel and how we think all are interconnected with each other. And if we think about what's in our control here, we recognize our emotions aren't in our control. So maybe we can use our behavior and our thoughts to have better control over how we're feeling or how we're, or our responses to how we're feeling. So what could that look like? Okay, we've recognized the emotion we're feeling is maybe nerves or fear or anxiety, those kind of really challenging emotions when, when you're involved in a sport like, like canoeing or ca kayaking. So maybe, you know, we recognize, okay, these are the nerves. This is what I'm thinking about when it brings, or this is the emotion. And this is what I'm thinking about. So this is a ne the next question is, what do I think when I feel this way? So maybe those emotions come as a result of thinking of what if something goes wrong? What if I capsize? The last time I paddled this route, this thing happened. You know, so you're kind of drawing on past experience, which, you know, fear can obviously be built up by past negative experiences or the worrying about the what ifs. What if this goes wrong? What if these things, bad things happen? And you build up that fear and that, that anxiety about the thing that might happen. What is the physical or what is the behavioral response that can come as a result of the feelings, the thoughts that I've just explained? Well, it could be physical tension. So you may tense up in the boat. And me and Hannah were talking about this just before. I've never, I have to admit, I think I've probably canoed once in my whole life or been in a kayak once or twice in my whole life. Um, but it does make sense. But Hannah was saying that sometimes when you're going through rapids and white water is to actually relax into it and go with it rather than to tense up against it. And that's actually the same across so many other sports is to actually relax the body. So maybe in response to nerves, fear and anxiety and you know, all those what ifs, we start to tense up. Maybe we even freeze. We're focusing on the wrong things. Maybe we're focused on you know things that are not going to help us and we're responding poorly to mistakes. So, OK, I've capsized. A poor response to making a mistake like that led me to capsizing would be to panic or to not go through the normal, you know, rolling technique that you may have learned in one of the webinars already. So even just naming what the emotion is, what I'm thinking about maybe before the emotion happens or once I feel that emotion, how it causes me to think. And then what's the resulting behavior or action when I'm actually in the boat? So then. We can learn to change it. Once we've actually identified, it's very hard to change something we don't know what it is. So now we've named it. Now we can change it. So as you might have seen, you might see here, I've changed the thought. So what if we were to change the thought, the kind of self-talk type um, piece here? So instead of it being, what if something goes wrong? What if I capsized the last time I paddled in this route, this thing happened, you know, this negative thing happened. Okay, let's change the thinking around that. 
I'm prepared, you know, start thinking, well, I'm prepared, I'm prepared for this. I've trained, I know the route, I've gotten to know, I've gotten to know all the kind of challenging parts. I'm more experienced. Uh, my coach is going to be with me if anything goes wrong. And I also know how to get myself out of, if this happens again, I know what to do this time. So even just having that kind of change in your kind of thought pattern in your self-talk could might lead to change in how you're feeling. So you might notice I've left nerves up there because nerves are not necessarily a good or a bad emotion. And, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but nerves can still happen even when you have a positive mindset and you have more positive self-talk. Nerves can still happen, but instead of it being fear and anxiety that accompany it, it can be nerves plus anticipation plus excitement. You know, so now those those kind of negative emotions have flipped to something a little bit more positive to go with the nerves. And what might that do to our behavior? So maybe we might be more likely if we're focused on, the, you know, how prepared we are, how experienced we are, we're thinking through the training we've done, we know our coach is with us, we might be more likely to focus on the process and what we can control. We might respond better to mistakes because we feel more confident. We might move more freely with less tension. Now, this is a big assumption that's going to, that all these things will change based on a small switch in our thinking. But you could imagine that if, if you have the ability to always recognize those negative thought patterns that follow or cause those negative emotions, if you can constantly be able to change them like that to be something more positive, it will have a knock on effect if you keep practicing it. It's a skill at the end of the day, changing your self talk, changing your, your, your thought patterns takes practice takes work the same way as learning to paddle took work but it can help change so much more when you're actually in the boat and then the third the third idea is reframing it now you're probably trying to figure out what is this picture she's showing us here and if you're on a phone it's probably even harder to see but what this image is is at the bottom of the first hill of a roller coaster so anyone who's ever been on a roller coaster has probably knows this feeling you know, you're at the bottom of the roller coaster, you've just left the station or wherever you are, and you're sitting in, you've got the big uh, seatbelt on, you're strapped in, you're checking the seatbelt to make sure, oh, is it so secure? Oh my goodness. And the, the tick, tick, tick up that first hill has started, up that first slope. So it's tick, 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 ticking up slowly, slowly, slowly. The anticipation is building you know it's coming, you're getting excited, you're getting closer and closer to the top and you know once you get to the top, the ride's going to start and it'll be quick and it'll be exciting. What are the things we're feeling in this moment? We're probably feeling our heart is pounding in our chest, our stomach is full of butterflies, probably have a dry mouth, probably have sweaty hands, probably thinking I could do with a wee, a wee right now. Um, Maybe our mind is racing a million things like that. You're thinking of the worst possible outcome. What if the seatbelt comes off? What if we fall off? What if this is the one roller coaster that breaks? All those kind of negative thoughts. But yet we paid to do that. We've chosen to be in this situation. And, you know, we, it, we, we see it. We see those feelings and we perceive those feelings as excitement, as anticipation. Um, but if you think about it, when, you know, you are nervous, a lot of those same responses, you know, we have the pounding heart, butterflies in the stomach, dry mouth, sweaty hands, but suddenly we perceive those nerves, those nerves as bad, you know, they're the ner their nerves and their fear and their anxiety and their signs that we're, that something bad is going to happen, something threatening. Instead of it being something, the anticipation of something good, like we do when we're on a roller coaster. So when it comes to something like nerves, and that's why I left it up for both the negative and the positive thought patterns is because nerves are just a, physio a physiological response, but the actual emotion of nerves is given is dictated by us. We decide whether those feelings are nerves that are good, that are productive, or nerves that are bad, that are threatening, that are going to threaten, that are causing us to feel like we want to escape. So even just recognizing that the next time you feel those nervous emotions and those feelings can or those nervous feelings which may also anticipate or accompany fear you know those same physical responses may accompany what you you perceive as a fear response recognize you know recognize and say okay actually i've been in situations where 
this is just part of it. This is normal. This is what I've, this is all part of what I'm doing. You know, I say this to athletes, I kind of ask, you know, we talk about, you know, nerves of being on a start line, for example, and all those physical feelings that they might have, they're about to run a hundred meter final, for example. And they'll say all of these different physical responses and, and, and say that those things are bad but then we'll say that they've still been able to perform well, even though those physical responses are there. So it's not necessarily that those physical responses are going to inhibit our performance. It's what we're thinking about that physical response. If we tell ourselves that our heart beating, our stomach, the butterflies in the stomach, the jelly legs, the dry mouth is a sign of something bad, it is going to be something bad. If they're a sign that this is normal, this is part of it, then they're just something good. They're just part of the the experience. So learning to reframe those emotions to match the situation. Obviously, sometimes fear responses, we need to listen to it because there is danger involved. And if if the fear is responses in some in response to a real threat, then you need to listen to it. But if it's just in response to something like you're trying out a new route and you're just a bit bit nervous because you don't know what to expect. But like I said, your coach is there, you're very experienced you know how to get yourself out of situations, then they're, they're probably just emotions to just accept as normal. So the next strategy, so when it comes to managing emotions like fear or nerves or anxiety, we mentioned the thoughts, that kind of cognitive element, maybe trying to use some breathing techniques for that physical element. Now I tried, I didn't intentionally pick all American athletes, but they just seem to be the best ones showing athletes breathing. I was trying to find athletes in kayaks and canoes breathing, but a lot of them looked like they were mid-race. But you get the idea, that idea of using breathing techniques as a way of managing emotions. And there's different ways we, why we would use breathing techniques to manage our emotions I think Catherine may have mentioned a few of these already box breathing I think was mentioned and we're going to try some of that so breathing techniques can be great from a physical point of view you know that can help slow you know calm the nervous system and slow all those physiological responses so start to you know reduce the heart rate kind of calm those butterflies just feel like you're gaining a bit more control over those quite frantic physical responses that you know the adrenaline in the body is caused in response to nerves and fear so you can kind of calm everything down with your breathing, but it can also act as a centering point as well. So it can act as a distraction from the thoughts, give you something else to focus on. So if you're just focused on your breathing, taking deep breaths in and out, hopefully it's giving you a different focus away from the thoughts that are creating those negative emotions that we mentioned in that kind of triangle. So we're going to try a breathing activity here. And rather than me counting it, I'm going to let you follow along on a video. Now, there's no audio to it. You're just going to watch along. There's going to be a count. This uh, technique is called box breathing. I'm going to show really, really popular with athletes, but it can be adopted by anyone. It's quick. It's easy. And it creates a nice rhythmic pattern to your breathing. It involves breathing in for a count of four, holding for a count of four, breathing out for a count of four and then starting or holding again for a count of four and then starting again. It just creates that kind of rhythm, gives you something to count. So it's distraction and it's also a nice breathing pattern. So we're going to try that now if this video decides to work for me. Oh, here it is. Take a moment to create awareness to your breath and follow along as we do or square breathing exercise. Relax your body and start by picturing a box with equal sides. Now inhale through your nose along the top line. One, two, three, four. Hold going down the side. One, two, three, four. Exhale through your nose along the bottom line. One, two, three, four. Hold going up the side. One, two, three, four. Again, inhale. One, two, three, four. Hold. One, two, 
three, four, exhale, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, inhale, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, exhale, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four. Remember to do this for at least three to five cycles. Visit our website and mobile app. So that, unfortunately, we couldn't get the, the audio to work. So you're probably just hearing me breathing. Um, but just a really nice, easy to, to implement and easy to practice kind of breathing technique that can be used just as a quick way to kind of ground yourself, to calm physically and mentally as well. Um, and another one, if you prefer more a more physical kind of element to your breathing activities, a really nice one that we can use is progressive muscle relaxation. We're going to try that here as well. So I would often give this to athletes who maybe struggle to sleep the night before a race. Um, it's a really nice relax, full body relaxation activity that incorporates breathing as well, that it can help encourage sleep by relaxing again the mind and the body in the same way as that last breathing exercise did. But it also involves kind of releasing tension through, as it says, their progressive muscle relaxation. So progressively relaxing, tensing and relaxing all the different muscles of the body until essentially you feel like a big ball of jelly at the end. And it's absolutely wonderful if you can get into it. Obviously that you don't want to be so relaxed that you're falling asleep if you're in the boat. So you can kind of incorporate a shorter version of this into your training. So maybe if you're about to head out, you know, what is one of the two of the places we carry an awful lot of tension, probably in our jaw, in our shoulders. So we're going to just try that here. And I'm actually going to do it instead of having a video. So this is kind of like a clipped version of the full thing. And if you go into YouTube, you can find 20 minute, 10 minute, 20 minute longer versions of this guided versions to do the full body. But this can be a good one to just kind of you know, for some relaxation into the body that you need to create for when you're actually in the boat. So what we're going to do, you're going to take a deep breath in. And as you do, I want you to create some tension in your, we're going to just do two parts. We're going to do our jaw, we're going to do our shoulders. So to do that, maybe clench your jaw. So create some extra tension for clenching your jaw, maybe bringing your shoulders up to your ears as you breathe in. So you're going to breathe in. Tense that jaw, clench or clench the tense that jaw, bring those shoulders up. And as you exhale, let them just drop. <sighs> Breathe out through the mouth, let everything just drop. And try that again. Inhale, clench the jaw and bring the shoulders up. Create tension in those shoulders. Exhale and let it all relax. Try one more time. Breathe in. Clench the jaw, bring the shoulders up. Exhale and let it all drop. If you're someone like me who spends a lot of time in front of the laptop, it can be just a nice reminder of where you're carrying your tension as well by creating more tension to then force more relaxation. You could imagine doing something like that when you're in the boat, maybe gripping the paddle. So maybe when you're out actually, you know, going through the motions, gripping the paddle and then letting it relax, gripping and letting it relax. So it doesn't have to be as obvious as the shoulders. You can do it wherever you want. It can be clenching the bum and letting it relax, whatever works. It kind of is creating a focal point, kind of a grounding position, a kind of a grounding point for the mind. It's giving something to focus on while also creating some physical tension as well. So some really nice activities that you can try as another kind of emotion regulation kind of activity, distraction, whatever you want to call it. So another thing um, that we want to look at is how we can control our focus and our attention, because when we're out in the boat, well, when you're out in the boat, I will not be out in the boat. But when you're out in the boat, you want to be able to maintain your focus and your attention on the right things and not let it drift or get distracted or focus on the wrong things, which can probably lead to more negative emotions. So we're going to watch a video here again. You're not going to hear sound, but there should be instruction on the video. Make sure to turn on the closed captions so you can see it. But I want you to see why, how important it is 
to be able to manage our focus and attention. If you've already obviously, if you've already seen this, that's great. If you haven't, hopefully you learned something from it. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Okay, so I just want you to really focus on the players wearing white, how many times they count the basketball. So really focus on that instruction. How many passes did you count? So I've shown this in different classes and the answers vary all the way from 13 up to 20. Um, see what you see if you got anywhere close. The correct answer is 15 passes. You got 15. Well done. But did you see the gorilla? If you're like me, when I was sitting in my first in first year in psychology, all the way back down in, in UL back in 2007 and going, there was no gorilla in that video. I do not believe this. This is a joke. There was a gorilla. <laughs> and if you didn't see it and you feel really stupid, don't worry. That was how I felt. And if you did feel really stupid and you didn't this see, video. if you didn't see that gorilla, that's okay. It means you're too focused on the instruction you're given, which is counting the basketballs. And the reason I wanted to show that as a way, you know, as a, um, a method of, you know, of in introducing focus and the importance of focus is I gave you an instruction, which was to count the, the passes of the basketball to the players in white. So you were, it, you know, if you were really focused and solely focused and all your attention was on that, you may have missed something really, really obvious and really glaringly obvious to some people that was going on around you. Now apply that in the boat where you're in situations where you shouldn't be getting distracted. You don't want to get your, your attention dragged to something when you're about to hit quite a difficult part of a course. And you are too worried about where, if you're in a race, where the person next to you is and you're not paying attention to what's going on. It actually could have dangerous consequences. So you want to be making sure that you're paying attention to the right things at the right time. Okay, this doesn't want to move on. Let's go. There we go. So one way of, maintaining uh, focus or being able to switch your focus. So sometimes it's not a case of that you're always fully maintaining your focus. Focus can drift, but it's how can I get it back? So one really simple way, and I think, um, I can't remember who it was, whether it was Catherine or one of the panelists who mentioned um, putting a dot on the boat, you know, putting a dot on the boat that re represents something. If you watch any of the rugby matches that are going on at the moment in the Six Nations, you may have noticed strapping around the players' wrists and they might have a little word, phrase, maybe even um, a cross to signify their religion. These are all little kind of keywords or phrases or, you know, little kind of refocusing kind of uh, strategies that once they see that, there's a meaning to that word, that phrase or that symbol that's to tell them to refocus or to remind them of something important. So when they're getting distracted, they see it, they notice it on their hand and they know what to switch their attention to, or maybe it's to motivate them. So different cue words or phrases, um, they can be, they can come in the form of informational, which is just very, as it's, you know, very black and white, emotion free. Um, they can be motivational. Uh, my example here is Ronnie Coleman. The students that I've shown this always love this one. So Ronnie Coleman being a power lifter who I think has, probably taking an awful lot of steroids because he lifts very, very, very heavy weights. But his motivational phrase to himself is lightweight baby. You may have seen the videos or something that's refocusing. But to go back to the informational one for a second. So, you know, informational is just something specific to what you're about to execute. So this is Lindsay Sharp. Um, she was an eight, she is an 800 meter runner. Um, won a silver medal that she's holding there at the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, actually in her hometown of Glasgow. Um, and a lot of pressure on her. She'd won a Commonwealth medal before, home crowd. So 
she knew it could be very easy to get distracted by the crowd or who's in the audience or the whole occasion of the moment. So what she did was write on her hand and you can see it there, get out strong, commit. That's all she wrote on her hand. But what that probably meant was get out strong, which was probably a certain pace that she had set for the first 100 metres of her 800 metre race. You know, whatever the timing or what or whatever that looked like, it's hard to say, but get out strong meant something to her and then commit to the pace that she set. And she ended up with silver medal. So there was something in it. And she actually ended up getting that tattooed on her wrist because it became so synonymous with how she raced. Now, obviously, it's very simple. It's a very simplified way of looking at it. But there's so much information that you probably get from your coach, from, from yourself, so much feedback from the water. Just giving having some real key phrases to keep you focused. So it could be something to do with paddling. It could be something to do with body positioning in the boat. It could be something to do with where your attention is. Whatever works for you. But for her, the focus was attacking that first 100 meters of her 800 meter race and then committing to the pace that she set. That was what was really important for her. And she put it on that part of her hand because obviously in the 800 meters, you start standing up. So the last thing she was looking at when her hand was in front of her was those words. So even when the occasion was, you know, those last minute negative thoughts could have flooded her head. She had something else to just refocus her or take her attention from that. I want another one I really like. I work with track cycling and I work um, Jens Voigt, what is a kind of a, a legend of, of cycling in general. And he actually had these words written down the frame of his bike, shut up legs, <laughs> which it's it's simple, it's powerful, is a positive motivation, maybe not, but if it worked for him, who's to say, you know, he's very, very successful athlete, so I'm not going to question it. But you could imagine when you're absolutely wrecked, you're going up a hill in the Tour de France, you, your legs are screaming, you look down at the frame and the frame is telling you shut up legs. OK, let's stop paying attention to what my legs are saying. What can I focus on instead? Let's focus on the hill in front of me. Let's focus on what else is around me. So that kind of phrase could tell him to focus on something else, not pay attention to the pain in his body and switch the attention outward. So just some really or motivational ones. Doesn't have to be lightweight, baby. It can be you got this. You're in great shape. Keep going. You love this. Whatever works for you. For me, it was fast and relaxed, fast and relaxed. I love saying that to myself, it kind of became like a rhythm when I was running. Whatever keywords or phrases work for you, depending on what it is you need, is it that you get too caught up in the emotion? Is it that you, you can get caught up in the negative? Or is it that you actually just focus too, you know, you get too caught up and focus on something really specific and you need to change your, your realm of focus to something external or internal. So depending on where it is, you might start to identify what keywords or phrases work for you. And you don't just have to have one or two. It can be different ones for different parts of, of a race or different parts of training or different parts of being out in the boat, um, depending on what it is you need. So then looking at building confidence, we may run a little bit over eight, so I apologize, but I'll get try to get fly through this. Um, so the next thing is building confidence, because now you've learned different ways to manage your emotions. But confidence may be an issue and confidence is something that if you're going to be getting out in a boat and attacking, you know, whitewater rapids and some really difficult routes um, in your boat, you want to make sure that you're confident. And, you know, whenever I ask athletes, where does where do they gain confidence? Where does confidence come from for them? It usually the response is, oh, from a good result. But do you want to have a, do you want to wait till a good result happens? before you're confident you know what if it's the first time you're attacking a certain route or what is the first time you're getting in the boat you want to have some you know getting in the boat on your own or getting in the going in the boat without your coach there or whatever it is you want to have another source of confidence that is not just from a result in a competition because that's not stable it's not consistent you want it to be coming from something that you can actually rely on consistently so doing something as simple as recognizing your strengths, you know, we pay a lot of, oops, we pay a lot, spend a lot of time and we pay a lot of attention to the things we need to work on. So, you know, if I was to ask you all, what are the things you need to work on from a physical point of view, maybe a technical point of view, psychological lifestyle in this sense means like nutrition, sleep, stress management, those kind of things, work life balance what are the things that you need to work on to improve to be a better paddler 
you'd probably be able to kind of list them pretty quickly. But when it comes to strengths, what I find, even with elite athletes who compete at the highest level, they're a little bit more stumped, kind of go, what are my, what are my strengths? What am I good at? Because so many, so many of us are always focused on getting better and working on improving. We don't take time to take stock of what we're actually good at already. And confidence comes from being able to recognize what we're good at and what we're doing well. And I'd already flipped onto it, so I'm going to go on to it. The example, I'm going to use my own brother. Um, you may, if you're a fan of athletics at all, uh, there's two Olympians in my family and I am not the more successful one. So I have a younger brother who is a very good athlete as well. His name is Thomas, European medalist, fourth place at the Olympic Games in Rio. And this is actually something I found in entry. This is not verbatim from him, but I just thought it was just such a good quote to kind of illustrate the importance of being able to recognize our strengths. So this is him talking about a race, the race where he won the bronze medal at the European Championships a few years ago where he was neck and neck with a French athlete down the home straight for the bronze and he pipped him on the line. Um, kind of to give you a bit of context to this, this quote, the way Thomas races a 400 meter hurdles, which is obviously one lap of a track, is the first 250 or 300 meters, he goes out quite conservatively because he has a certain stride pattern that means he won't go out super, super quick, which means that about 250 or 300 meters into the race, he could be towards the back, if not last in the race. Um, especially in very high level races, which, as you can imagine, as his family is very, very stressful to watch. But the reason he runs this is because he's a certain stride pattern. He takes quite big strides, so he doesn't have as quick a turnover. So he's not moving as fast as the other athletes at the start. But what that means is he's conserving energy. So he actually has more energy for the end of the race. So where his strengths lie are in that last 100 meters. He seems to have a sixth gear and seems to be kind of going faster when everyone else is tying up because of the way he approaches the first half of his race. Now, if he wasn't confident in his strengths in that latter half of his race, he would probably be very easily caught up with what the other athletes are doing. You know, he might get distracted by someone in the lane outside of him who goes off really fast and goes with that person, ruining his race plan and then not actually being able to use his strengths at the end anyway. So for him, being confidence comes for the confidence to be able to execute his race plan comes from knowing what he's good at and being, you know, comfortable with that and being OK to know that I can play to my strengths when the time comes and I just have to be patient to wait, wait for that to come around. And it always does. It, it more often than not has paid off for him. So just a really kind of nice example of how that recognizing your strengths is really, really important and why doing an exercise like that can be a really nice confidence builder. And another thing I like to do with athletes, and this is athletes of all ages, like I was doing this over in Tokyo with, with senior, you know, senior men was sitting down and writing list of evidence, evidence of all the sources of confidence that they currently have. So, you know, what are all the, re you know, asking this question, what are the reasons or evidence that you'd be able to produce a good performance or be able to execute or achieve the goal that you've set for yourself what are the reasons or evidence for that you know thinking helping them think of all the things you've done that will make you feel confident so that could be reflecting on good training sessions it could be reflecting on personal best they might have set in the gym positive feedback from the coach or from training partners obviously good results um improvements they've made since last year maybe technically uh, different things like that so reflecting on all the things that would suggest that they're tracking towards their goal you know what are the improvements you've made what is the what are the gains you've made that are would show that you're moving towards achieving what you want to achieve and I get them to write it down literally writing a list of what it is and they have it in their phone they have it on a piece of paper as just a reminder that when those again when we think back to earlier on in the presentation those negative thoughts are niggling and threatening your confidence and threatening to kind of overhaul your emotions by focusing on the negatives and all the reasons why you might not achieve your goal if you have a really solid clear list of evidence of why I can achieve my goal written somewhere that you can actually write it write, to read it out you know it can help switch switch your attention back to what I'm good at what I'm confident at why I okay I'm, I'm worried about these things happening but here's the evidence to say that I'm ready for it if it does happen or here's the evidence to say that I'm good in these situations things like that 
And another example of this being illustrated is Annelise Murphy, who won a silver medal at the Olympics in Rio in 2016 in uh, sailing. So um, in sailing, like in, um, in canoeing and kayaking, there's an awful lot of variables to take into account. So as part of Annelise's training, um, they spent about six months in the year or 18, about 18 months before the games, they spent six of those months living in Rio training on the course, getting to know the wind shifts, the water conditions, the tides, all the different ways the course could play out. So that when it actually came to the race, there was nothing that was going to throw her. So that, you know, we talk about, think back to that circle of control, knowledge of the race course, knowledge of the conditions, knowledge of the environment played into her hands because she knew she was confident that she had all the right knowledge and information to be able to execute the best race in that course because she had done the work so that's where her confidence came from was the work she put in in advance so neither of those are um those examples of confidence come from specifically from results but they did lead to good results they came from the work that they put in from the ability to recognize and be self-aware and reflect and then finally we're going to finish off with a little bit of visualization um well, I'm calling it visualization here. What it, what we refer to it in sports psychology is imagery, because rather than it being solely something that you you are imagining seeing a situation with with imagery, which is what we think of, we think of visualization imagery. We want to try and include more we more of our senses. We don't want to just imagine seeing the situation. We want to imagine feeling it, feeling the nerves, feeling the the cold of the water, feeling the, the boat drifting from side to side, all those kind of things. We want to build up a really vivid image because our brains don't really comprehend between an imagined image and an actual memory. You know, we just, if, if it's vivid enough, it's going to, it's not really going to be able to comprehend. And it's also not very good at comprehending between you actually doing something and imagining it because the same parts of our brains that are control of motor control are the say are also working to a lesser extent who are imagining executing those those actions so we can connect we can strengthen neural pathways of doing something by even just imagining ourselves doing it so um i like this quote but it my uh, my little bar at the top is actually blocking it so i can let you read it which is a really nice example of a basketball player saying that they they've imagined doing this dunk or you, you know shooting their shot so many times that when it actually came to the game it's like they'd already made it you know that they've imagined it so many times and so vividly that when the reality came it's like they'd done it already because it's like their mind had already practiced it so when it comes to using imagery so where do you even start well usually it's just starting small and building it up you know it can be a tiring pursuit to try and sit and imagine in real detail um, so first of all, what I encourage is just to try and sit and imagine um, imagine seeing something, maybe a really familiar image. So maybe it's somewhere, a route that you go all the time. Maybe it's a training route that you use. Try to pick familiar surroundings and imagine that. What do you see? Then what do you hear? What do you feel physically? Maybe what do you feel emotionally? picturing the environment around you and then you can start adding in movement and kind of you know adding some scenarios into it but actually it's a skill to be built up it's a skill to be practiced and it can take time to get used to it so just being patient and just becoming really good at creating a vivid image with lots of senses incorporated and then start to you know build that image and use it as an opportunity to practice challenging parts of the course in your head so maybe you've just done a really challenging um part of some rapids okay go home and imagine yourself doing that imagine doing so rather than having to go through it over and over again physically and becoming tired go home and imagine it maybe get video footage and watch that then imagine imagine that over and over try to build up that image and become more familiar um with it um so we might try it and we're going to try one now i i was going to try something related to be to paddling but i realized I don't know enough about it to create a really vivid image and I don't want to get something wrong and you're rolling your eyes. So we're actually going to try one that's kind of like a neutral a neutral one that's going to be in your own kitchen. So I want everyone just to close their eyes 
because when you want to do it you want to try to start with anyway you want to be trying nice and relaxed and just kind of become quite focused so i just want everyone to close their eyes i'll close my eyes as last year because you can probably see my screen face on the screen so we're going to close our eyes and you're just going to relax wherever you are so if you're sitting or you're lying down just get into a comfortable position and we're just going to take a few breaths so you're just going to breathe in through your nose Exhale out through your mouth. Just pay attention to the breath, just for another couple of times. I want you to imagine that you're in your kitchen at home. I want you to see the surroundings of your kitchen. Place yourself somewhere where you'd usually do some food prep. So maybe there's a counter in front of you, a table, wherever you usually chop some vegetables or do some food prep. What can you see? What are the colors? You see cabinets, maybe there's a window. What can you see out the window if there is one? Try and picture all the surroundings around you. I pay attention to any sounds that you might hear. Maybe the radio's on. Maybe there's a sound of cars going by on a road. Maybe you're like me and you live in the country and hear cows, some chatter, other people in the kitchen. Try to pay attention to some sounds. Now, once you've created a bit of an image of your surroundings, I want you to go to wherever you keep your sharp knives in the kitchen. And you're going to take one and hold it in your hand. Whatever your favorite one is for chopping. We all have one or two favorites for chopping. Mine is a big silver knife, the black handle. I can feel the cold of the metal in my hand and I feel the weight of it in my hand as I'm lifting it up. With your other hand, I want you to grab a chopping board that you'd usually use for food prep. So it could be wood, you might feel the rough of the wood. I'm picking up a white plastic one. It's white, it's rough, rough and bumpy on, under the fingers to touch. And I'm putting those on my kitchen counter. Place the knife down onto the kitchen counter beside the chopping board. And now I want you to grab a lemon. Wherever you keep your lemons, fridge, fruit bowl, see the fruit bowl, walk over to it and pick up a lemon. You can feel the skin, it's firm, the bumps, it feels smooth. Bring it over and put it on the chopping board. Now you're going to pick up your knife and you're going to cut the lemon in half. So you're going to pick up the knife and you're going to push it down through the skin couple of back and forth sweeping motions until you cut it in two. You might feel a bit of the juice squirt out onto your fingers, maybe it's sticky, you smell the citrusy of the lemon, feel it kind of the texture of it on your fingers. Now take one of those halves, and cut it again into half. So now you should have two halves, two pieces. Just pick up one of those sections, have a look at it, 
see the lemon, see the skin, see the inside of it, the pulp. Give it a squeeze, you can feel it. Maybe you can smell the citrus now, it's even stronger. It smells really fresh. What you're going to do is you're going to bite into that lemon. Feel the juice in your mouth. It's bitter. It's hit the back of your jaw. It's horrible. It's mouth filled with saliva. You can spit it out if you want, or you can throw it in the bin. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. Now, you might find that weird. You might find that good. But that's a really kind of simplified version of like an imagery, a guided imagery. It's not specific to any sport, but you can see where you're building up some detail. You're building up some, um, some kind of vivid imagery, some pictures, using some senses, incorporating some movement. And what I've done, and I've done this with some classes, and it works better with some than others. There's no real way I've noticed it. But if I have my eyes open and I'm watching, sometimes you might see some people wince when they bite the lemon. And hopefully that means it means the imagery has been really powerful because they can nearly imagine the taste. If any of you are doing it along and you winced, that's brilliant. If you didn't, don't worry. Obviously, that doesn't have a huge amount of application to being in the boat, but you could imagine, you know, doing that, imagining yourself sitting in your boat. What do you see around you, whether it's the, you know, a river or it's the ocean, seeing the color, maybe feeling the waves lapping against the boat, feel the cool of the water as it's kind of hitting against you. Maybe your feet are a bit wet and imagine starting to paddle and maybe picturing the, the environment around you. You can imagine the power of that. So that is it for this evening. I've thrown lots of different strategies at you. Really simple, um, really applicable, I hope. Um, and now I'd just love to open the floor to some questions if anyone has anything. Thank you so much, Jesse. <clears throat> um, you okay to stop the screen share there? And oh yeah, people Perfect. can see you better. <laughs> no, great. I'm uh, that was, there on the screen. Yeah, that was a very very complete presentation. Um, I think you put a lot in there, a, a lot that well, I've been nasty for so many years, I could relate to. But I think <clears throat> all paddlers could could really relate to that. I hope so. Um, yeah, I really like that part about naming it and then changing it. I think that's such a key part in. In a lot of it, sometimes we maybe build unrealistic expectations around feelings and emotions. And yeah. I know for me, I always thought, oh, sure, when I get better, I won't feel nervous anymore. I might not feel and afraid or scared, but they actually still are there. But how you choose to manage it is, is what you can really change in, in exactly. some of that. Yeah. Uh, I haven't got any questions yet. I'm just giving people time to. to no worries. Kind of, um, <laughs> I know there's a lot of them. Well, so people are probably going, "Whoa!" No, I'd say they're still in their imagery of the lemon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking that I was like, "Could I try and spoof it and pretend I'm a paddler?" And I was like, "I just don't want to get it wrong." Yeah. Yeah. No. And we, I guess, we have quite a few dis different disciplines and boats yeah. and environments, so it can be slightly different. But I think. It, it's probably one that's brilliant to do in the boat as well yeah. um I certainly Absolutely. find that very powerful when it was done in the boat at the beginning or the end of a session can be revisiting some of those things we felt or experienced or um and the ones you want to keep and take home with you for, yeah. for the next session or, or the next trip uh exactly. too often we just kind of hop by the boat get changed and, and run home so yeah. there, there is a real opportunity there exactly um, everyone's been really quiet on the questions. So. <laughs> everyone's fatigued. <laughs> they got yeah. to week 16. They're just happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe a um, little bit. Uh, um, Would you have worked with a sports psychologist at any point, Hannah, in your own career? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I worked for a sports psychologist. Well, the same one from uh, Yad. 12 years almost we worked together um he had a lot of work to do <laughs> oh the questions that come to, no I think I I had 
yeah, I, I had very unrealistic expectations around um, some of what was happening. I'd like, I guess, that part around what you control, can control, yeah. what you can influence and what you can't control. And I think the lines are blurred there a little bit sometimes yeah. and, and being able to define that quite clearly. And I thought your presentation did a great job with that because um, as you were saying, the emotions, I thought I could control emotions. No, you cannot. You can yeah. learn to name them. You can learn to work with them. You can, and you can use self-talk to, to change how you feel about them. But um, exactly. yeah, oh no, they're flying in the question. Oh, I can see them now. Sometimes it just takes a while. That's great. Um, no, actually they're telling us they thought it was brilliant, but they didn't. Oh, good. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, somebody said uh, from a constantly petrified partner, I will take all this on oh, board. Oh, I'm delighted. Thank you, Marie. Um, uh it was great very comprehensive it's the putting it into the practice that's the challenge absolutely yeah um uh i, I asked Catherine really. last time about always missing catching a specific eddy and how it has got into my head i will try imagery any other suggestions yeah that, that was somebody who came onto the fear workshop so catching yeah. an eddy so let's say mm -hmm. you're on a river and there's some so eddies are formed behind rocks and sometimes it can be quite difficult to get certain ones yeah and this person was experienced and they seem to the same eddy seems to bring the same feelings and struggles um so have you got maybe any specific suggestions she's saying try an imagery but maybe the when of when to do that imagery might be um, yeah yeah i think maybe beforehand you know maybe the day before the night before when you're going out and you're kind of getting ready taking some time before you kind of leave the house or even when you're actually like you said in the water in the boat before you set off definitely try the imagery I would nearly get some video footage of maybe a time you have caught it or someone else catching it so you can actually have some real relevant imagery to kind of nearly to recreate but I think also sometimes the self-talk around it, because it sounds like it's gotten into your head because you've created an expectation around it that now when you're coming to that eddy, you know, it's coming, you've built it up to be something bigger. So, you know, instead of it being like, I have to catch it this time, this is my last go or this, you know, I haven't caught it in six months. This is going to be the day and creating a huge amount of expectation around it instead like like I mentioned what are the reasons why I can what are, what do I do to catch every other eddy why is this one different what am I going to focus on instead of it being all about the eddy which is like an outcome catching the eddy is the outcome bring it back to what I can control here which is what do I physically do in a boat to catch an eddy where is my what am I looking at what am I doing in the boat what am I doing to physically prepare it so taking the kind of the focus away from the eddy you know, because it sounds like this is, it's just this one specific one, but you obviously are able to catch other ones. It's just this one has now become a sticking point. It's become a bit of a mental block. So focus on something else. Instead of it being, I have to, excuse me, I have to catch this one. It's like, well, how could, how do I catch other ones? Let's learn from what I've done in other ones. You know, sorry, my dogs are going mad there. I don't know if you can just hear them in the background. No, we can't hear them. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, maybe something like that. So try to reduce your expectations around this one. Let's not build it up. Let's just treat it like I treat every other eddy. You know, how do I usually prepare for that one? Probably not. You're probably thinking beyond it. You're not, probably not even thinking specifically about that one. But this one has created expectations. So finding ways to reduce it and then the imagery to actually feel more confident about approaching it can be a good way of trying it. Brilliant. Um, uh, Jesse, great Brilliant. workshop. Excellent. Um, is there any further reading you would recommend around this that's simple and easy to access? Now, yeah. I can I can feed back information post workshop. Yeah. We've done a little bit. I can of that. send you on an email because what I find sometimes is there's some really lovely podcasts as well as you know there's reading and there's books. There's some really nice podcasts as well. There's one called the High Performance Podcast, which interviews lots of different athletes. So you get little, you might not get loads from everyone, but I've gotten lots of nuggets because it talks to people at all different performances, whether it's sport or, or otherwise. And there's always nuggets to get from podcasts and it doesn't feel, you know, you kind of, from someone talking about their experience, you can get a lot as well. Um, and there's some books as well. I can't, I want to, I want to give some kind of good ones. So what I'll do, Hannah, is I'll send you some an email that you can kind of send out, but yeah, the High Performance Podcast I like. Um, there's a podcast called The Sideline Live, which I've done an interview before, but again, it's an in Irish-specific one. So it, she kind of delves into lots of Irish athletes' interests, and she's very interested in psychology herself. So often some of the, the conversation can go that route as well. So I sometimes find they can be really nice ways of picking up 
little tidbits of information as well as um, books. Um, I just can't think of a really good book. The Champion Mindset is a good one. Um, which are the cha- yeah the Champions Mindset, Champions Mind. Um, Craig Affenro or uh, and um, the Steve Peters Chimp Paradox. There's there's some in it that take it with a pinch of salt. It gets quite repetitive, but some of the kind of being able to manage and control our emotions is some kind of techniques and that can be really nice as well if you're if that's kind of what what's interested you as well yeah and like any kind of you talked about the chimp paradox that like there are trends in all of this and that was a big trend for a large period of time and everything was focused around that so chimp, chimp, chimp. <laughs> yeah it, it's trying to kind of find something that works for you and I think in sports, in well, in sport, full stop, but in mental health, it's not being afraid to try different things and yeah. and try it over a certain period of time. And it might not be the solution for you, or it might work in certain situations, but not in others. It doesn't mean it doesn't have value. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, this one. Any good techniques to bring focus back into training and diet from going off track? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I think I think the simplest thing is to start with why you're doing it. You know, when you want to bring your focus back, it's like, well, what is the goal? What's the kind of, you know, because sometimes we get so caught up in the diet and the day to day, we kind of forget why we're doing it. So actually revisiting why I'm doing it, what is motivating me to want to focus on my training and my diet? You know, what is if, if it's going off track? what's it going off track from like what's the track going towards because sometimes we don't revisit that it's going off track but you don't know how much by or if I keep going off track will I ever get back so setting some goals and starting with that outcome goal that overall like what is it that I want to achieve by doing this training and following this diet and then what are the steps to actually achieve that what's actionable kind of day-to-day steps so be realistic with it like if you you know, I'm working with people trying to qualify for the Olympics in Paris, but they might find that like they're completely demotivated from training and they're finding it really hard to stick to their nutrition plan. Well, they kind of say, OK, well, what are simple, achievable steps today? OK, you need you need you might be in, you know, a very high volume sport that you need a huge calorific intake and they're, they might be really struggling with just eating the volume. OK, well, let, let's see little ways that you can just increase your intake every day so rather than just saying I can't do it I'm just going to give up okay well what's one little actionable step that will get me back towards that sometimes I think when we we don't know why we're doing it we don't know what the goal is and then we don't we don't really have any specific plan of how we're going to get back on track so back on track that could be anything from one bad day to like six months of being off track so you know, actually identifying what is off track and what is one simple step that I can get me back rather than trying to be turning everything around in one day and be completely demotivated when that's too hard. What's one thing I can do for my diet? Okay, my diet's off track because I've been eating takeaways four nights a week. Oh, how can I get it to two nights a week? How can I get it to no nights a week? How can I be once a month? You know, I think we try to expect too much too quick, you know, so focus being actually writing down being accountable to the goals that you've set for yourself what that goal is you're trying to achieve and some kind of step by step of how you're going to get there commit it to paper be accountable to someone else someone else is now now involved in your goal so it's hard when you go off track someone else is involved and you're you feel a bit more accountable to them as well so you know I think just being really aware of what the goal is and what the steps are to do it can help to help you come back on track yeah and you mentioned earlier on, oh, that you mentioned managing expectations but gathering evidence because as you say one bad day is that necessarily you off track or is that just one bad day mm-hmm. um and yeah so there, there's a lot there sometimes yeah. we make these judgment calls around what's going on whereas we don't have the evidence to actually to make exactly. those calls like it's one is one week of going off track that detrimental or is it that you've for a whole year you've gone off track then there might be bigger steps to take so it's actually recognizing what off track looks like and what what the actual goal was so creating that self-awareness uh next question so this is um dragon boating i don't know if you've ever seen dragon boats a lot before no. so that well they're they're big crews they're massive boats and um you can have 20 people in it and i don't don't get me wrong so i, I don't want to get the numbers wrong but you have a lot of people working together mm. um 
and they're put into a holding area. So athletics, you know all about holding areas, uh, which can be up to 15, 20 minutes. Any suggestions how we can keep our focus here? This would be, so you're saying, sorry, the dragon boat, they're all part of a bigger team together. Uh, yeah, so they're yes. in a boat. So you've got about 20 people. I'm okay. going to, the, the person asking the question is going <laughs> to, she took me in a boat. She's going to, I'm going to get told off not knowing the exact number. Okay. <laughs> there's about 20, there's different size boats, but roughly, let's say there's a crew of 20 in, in the boat. Um, and you're, before your race starts, you're in this holding area um, for 15, 20 minutes. I'm guessing it's with other boats um, at that time. So okay suggestions for yeah. managing the crew in in that time so what are the challenge in something like that is because you're dealing with an awful lot of different personalities and what works for one might not be for another so I've worked in teams like in um I've worked with camogie teams and you know other GA teams and it's obviously more challenging than working with individuals so it's maybe not expecting that everyone will use the same method to focus and being okay with that so maybe some people need to kind of go into their own zone and be quiet and maybe you know who the chatty people are picking who those people are going to be and chatting with them like I don't know obviously you may not have access to music like in athletics in a call room there's no access to music so it might be that they're you know they're going doing some breathing activities you know I think it's recognizing what works for you in that moment because I think the hardest thing in that situation is expecting that everyone is going to be okay with doing the same activity or doing the same kind of strategy to maintain focus and then people who don't like that are losing focus I don't want to focus on my breathing for 20 minutes I want to I want to chat to someone I'm nervous I need to talk when I'm nervous but they're all everyone's quiet and now I'm distracted so you need to know what the personalities are and manage them so maybe if there are the people who like to chat beforehand make sure they are near each other that they can chat or make sure that they picked out who they are you know so sometimes having the conversation as a group and say well what do you need? What helps you focus? Is it completely zoning out and just chilling out and relaxing? Or is it chatting and kind of really releasing that nervous energy in that way? Once you even know who those kind of who your kind of tribe is in the within the wider team, it can even help to maintain that focus. And then just doing things like your breathing, breathing activities, um, maybe going through the race plan, maybe discussing the race plan among yourselves, those kind of things. Like 15, 20 minutes is a long time to hold focus. So maybe it's okay being okay with not being focused for that 20 minutes, being okay to learn to switch off and then only switching on for five minutes because I'm assuming the race has is however long it is and there needs to be a certain amount of focus then. So maybe it's rather than learning to focus for 20 minutes, maybe you need to learn to switch off for 18 and then be on right before you go out. So again, it's understanding what works for you like for me, I wouldn't have liked to be when I sat in a call room for 20 minutes. I didn't want to focus for 20 minutes. I wanted to be relaxed. I was watching what everyone else was doing, you know, tying my shoelace, picking up my nails, just kind of listening to what was going on, just generally kind of obser observing kind of non-judgmentally. Like so mindfulness can be a nice activity to kind of be OK with with that, you know, being in a scenario like that. But if you're someone who feels you need to be focused because you get too caught up with what's going on maybe then you have something more into there like focusing on your breathing or fo thinking through race tactics so yeah I think that's the biggest challenge is making sure you're accommodating each individual as part of that wider team I hope that answers the question no I, I'd say it did and it's 22 she's correct 22. 22. okay it's a lot of people to manage yeah yeah um just wondering if you work with coaches and how they support and help athletes emotions under stress yeah so really good question and I think um I would work with coaches as part of like a multidisciplinary team and I often travel to competitions where you know I can be there but you know maybe the, the coach can't be uh, they can't be always as involved in the pre pre-competition preparation or I'm not going to be there and the coach is going to be the one who's going to be with them straight right before they compete. So again, it's helping the coach understand how that athlete is under stress because you can't help them work with the emotions if they don't know what the emotions that athlete will have under stress and not assuming that because that person's quite stoic and quite quiet that they're nervous or that because that person's quite chatty, they're not nervous. Understanding what each athlete is like under stress and what they also need you know, so if that person 
when they're stressed, they tend to withdraw. They tend to be quite quiet. They tend to kind of go into their own zone. What do they need in that moment? Is that what they want to do? Or do they need some support? Do they need someone to bring them out of that zone with just some general chit chat or some confidence boosting information? So I think the, the most helpful thing you can do is sit down with the athlete and kind of say, okay, tell me about how you tend to be under stressful or nerve wracking situations, high pressure situations. What are the emotions? What are the feelings that tend to come up? And what will work? What works for you in that situation? What doesn't work for you? Because I want to be able to support the things that work and avoid the things that don't. Because I have seen coaches and these are brilliant coaches, but they make an assumption that, oh, everyone wants to be talked to and everyone wants to go through the race plan right before they go out to race. And it's actually, no, I want no chat before I go out or I want you to talk about something like the fake tan on my legs. I don't want to think about the race plan. We've done that thinking. I want to just be just completely distracted, you know. So I think as a coach, if you're working with athletes, is getting to know them and getting to know how they are in different situations is really valuable. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, yeah. And then uh, just feedback, great tools for patterns of all abilities. Thanks, <laughs> Jesse. Best of luck with the PhD. Looking forward to hearing of your results. Great. And the person who had asked the dragon boating question thought it was a great answer. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. okay. Thank you, Carla. <laughs> <laughs> so you passed the great questions. Yeah, and really we've got, we're so fortunate to have such a diverse sport that kind yeah. of presents quite different scenar scenarios, but I, as your point at the start, across the sport, we're all human and we all kind of face very similar challenges. So um, they just manifest themselves slightly differently. But um, yeah. Okay. I'm guessing that's it for, for okay. questions. Uh, thank you so much, Jesse. And you. yes, you did meet the expectation of finishing on a high. Oh, so for the series. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much.